To regulate a very vibrant and professional press in the length and breadth of Sierra Leone, the Independent Media Commission was constituted by an Act of Parliament emanating from the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the need for an independent body to regulate the media in the country. The Independent Media Commission of Sierra Leone started its operations in 2001 coming into existence by the Independent Media Commission Act No. 12 of 2000 as amended in 2006 and 2007, which provided for the establishment of an autonomous body for the regulation of mass media institutions and for other matters connected therewith. But why was the Commission created in the first place? Our mandate in the first place is to regulate the media throughout the country to ensure that media house journalists are keep the highest level of efficiency in media services. Especially so to ensure that the public is not taking any advantage by the media houses. You know one thing about the media, uh, the press they are to serve both themselves and the public. So the public interest comes very foremost. That's why the, this institution was uh, instituted, so that they can regulate the media. Luckily for us, um, we in Sludge at the time had a good relationship with President Kaba and were able to convince him. And of course, again, luckily for us, the minister at the time was a journalist himself, uh, Julius Spencer. So we all agreed to address the issues of the Public Order Act. President Kaba advised us, say, okay, start from, from the business of having a regulatory authority that would have both journalists and members of government in it to be able to address the issues of journalists in this country. So this is how we started. So Julius Spencer was very, very aggressive in making sure that uh, we work towards the setting of the IMC. And uh, I was also an Ibrahim Taiba. We are also very active in making sure that we work with the government. And we did have a collaborative effort with the government to make sure that we set up the Independent Media Commission. The formation of the IMC, it is from for the people this paper. When I came from Sweden, you know, which you got in by then was at the general of uh, uh, Sludge. Yes, the, 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 the college, the mass communication, it was under Jipo Felix George as president when I was secretary general of the uh, Saloon Association of Journalists with Bernadette Cole. That the mass communication was established. The commission is made up of 11 commissioners who make up the board and an executive secretary who runs the daily administration of the institution. The current commissioners of the commission are George S. Koyama, chairman of the commission, Commissioner Professor Eunice Taylor, chairperson of the technical committee, Commissioner Ansu Batilo Lansana, chairperson of the complaints committee, Commissioner Melinda Davis Esquire, Chairperson of the Integrity Committee. Commissioner Mustafa Mendeko Kosise, Chairperson of the Applications Committee. Commissioner Ethel Johnson, Chairperson of the Human Resource Administration Committee. Commissioner Alfinia Thompson, Chairperson for the Publicity Committee. Commissioner Eranos Thompson, Chairperson of the Fundraising and Project Committee. Commissioner Francis Sowa, Chairperson of the Advisory Committee on Advertisements. And Commissioner Dr. Victor Suma, Chairperson of the Finance Committee. 
the first place, the IMT has very vibrant commissioners and staff. Uh, when we took over, I made sure we assisted all the committees. Complaints committee, application committee, uh, policy committee, different, different committees, about nine of them. All these committees, as up to now, they are functioning very vibrantly. I believe we've made some progress. There is much more to be done, but where we are from where we came from, I think there's been significant progress here. We came in and we met the commission um, in a state in which um, I would say, I mean, was um, somehow dysfunctional and um, the staff morale was very low. Um, the working tools for staff, vehicle, laptops, and whatsoever were obsolete or uh, beyond uh, economical amend um, value of the state. And um, we've tried, I mean, to replace, I mean, some of the um, the laptops, um, get some of the equipment I mean, replaced and um, staff morale has been boosted up. We were also engaged I mean, with um, the media across the country and um, did some seminars I mean, for them. And we've created I mean, the impression I mean, in them that this commission is in for the good of the media practice in Sierra Leone. The objects for which the commission is established include promoting a free and pluralistic media throughout Sierra Leone ensuring that media institutions achieve the highest level of efficiency in the provision of media services and protecting the interests of the public against exploitation or abuse by media institutions. Well, in the area of successes, uh, we have competent and qualified staff members at the Commission, and uh, we have a regional office, and they are being manned by the experienced and qualified uh, media practitioners who had practiced media uh, related uh, activities around the country. So at least uh, when it comes to media regulation, we have uh, a monitoring and research unit that is on top of the situation. And we also have competent staff members within the commission that administer the activities of media regulation across the country. In total, we have three offices. We have the, region, we have the regional offices in both southern for the southern and eastern regions and then we have one in Makini. The one for the southern and eastern region is based in Bo and uh, there are plans on their way to have another regional office in Kenema for the eastern re region because we believe that in the post repeat area media regulation has to be robust. So as such we are thinking of uh, getting an office in Kenema and uh, also in Port Loco for the northwest regions. Key in the operations of the IMC are the committees set up to effectively run the machinery of the Commission. It's obvious. Years back, um, most of the work done by the IMC, the public has no knowledge about it and for that reason, they always think that the IMC is a toothless bulldog and because they didn't know much about the operations of the Commission. So because of that, the Public Relations Committee will be the link between the public and the Commissions. In a sense, we are there to make sure that all the activities of the IMC are being made known to the public and also an activity the Public Relations Committee will obviously make that known to the public and also media institutions. To apply for licenses to run a media institution in Sierra Leone, recourse is made to either the Technical Committee for Electronic Media or the Applications Committee for Print Media who have their work cut out for them. Well, as the country's regulatory body, we need to be able to assess any application for license. As you know, um, any radio station or electronic media that wants to operate in this country needs to get a license from IMC. And we're looking for a number of things. We're looking for the professional competence, the technical competence, administrative management, 
and also their programs. So to be able to do that, we need a committee that, that, can, that can assess all of these areas of interest. That's the job of the technical committee. When we get these applications, we, we assess them, and if we find them acceptable, we advise NATCOM to offer operating frequencies to them. We look at radios, televisions, and DTA that direct to home transmissions. The application committee is one of the subcommittees of the Independent Media Commission, and it, its a specific mandate is to vet applications that are presented to the Commission for the registration of newspapers and uh, magazines. We vet them to ensure that the information contained in the application form and the documentation, the supporting document provided to the Commission are accurate and meet the prescription in the regulatory instrument governing the Commission. That is the IMC Act and the media code of practice. We try to establish, first of all, that the, any media institution registering with the commission has an identifiable business office. And number two, the media institution has an editorial team. And the media institution clearly understand the differences between uh, editorial matters and management issues. We also want to confirm their ownership to the offices that they identify to the commission as their business of offices. And we also go to the extent of verifying the authenticity of documentation provided to the commission. When eventually media houses are fully registered and given the licenses to operate under the laws of Sierra Leone, regulation of their content becomes crucial, making the work of the complaints committee very, very, very important. This is the committee responsible for the handling of all complaints of the media in the Commission. Well, the Complaints Committee at the Independent Media Commission is very necessary because one of the key functions of the Commission is the adjudication of complaints from the public against media institutions. So it's a key proponent of the Commission. Well, as a committee, we think it is very imperative that the Commission functions as a regulator of media institutions that have been granted the rights that accumulate in the post-repeal era. You recall that the repeal of the criminal libel law is like a heavy weight lifted off the shoulders of journalists and media institutions generally. So the repeal is like a newfound right for journalists and media institutions. And as such, those rights, as in law, rights have correlates the correlates of rights and responsibilities. So if you give the journalists the right to express themselves, to publish, without the libel law hanging over their heads, it's like a newfound right they've got. But those rights go responsibilities. That is where the Independent Media Commission comes in handy, especially the Complaints Committee, so that it will be a check to those rights, that, that those rights should not be misused. In need of regulation under the IMC Act are also advertising agencies who have a statutory mandate to be registered with the IMC and operate within the prescribed code of ethics. The advertising industry in the country is growing at a very fast rate. There are concerns about unethical practices within the different advertising agencies. In fact, there is a serious concern that a number of people who produce adverts in Sierra Leone do not have the requisite knowledge and expertise. So as a commission which regulates the mass media and other matters connected therewith, advertising is part of the sectors that are regulated by 
the IMC. And the IMC Media Code of Practice is clear. It has a whole section on advertising, and that section provides for the establishment of an advertising advisory committee. So we are just complying with statute and trying to address several concerns, members of society. So this committee basically adjudicates complaints from members of uh, from members of the public against different kinds of adverts. So the committee works in different ways. First, it works with the very media houses to ensure that they do not broadcast or publish any advert that is unethical. The committee is also responsible um, um, in terms of ensuring that people who produce adverts have the required training and capacity. And above all, the committee now has moved towards the um, development of an advertising agency, um, an association of advertisers. So basically, what the committee is doing is to, among other things, ensure that the adverts that are published, broadcast or put online, they conform with basic ethical standards. For the Commission to operate optimally, the oversight operations of the Commissioners must be complemented by the daily operations of the staff. Staff welfare, therefore, is very important for the smooth running of the Commission. And the committee responsible for the oversight on staff welfare is the Human Resource Management Committee. In every area, you have to have the Human Resource Management Committee. First of all, it's a way of upgrading the lives of staff, the way they, they, they interact with, with, with one another in the office. So we have the Human Resource Management Committee at the IMC that looks into issues relating to the welfare of the staff at the IMC. And presently, there is no way that they can be, they can be promoted on the job. So what we do is that, that any positions that are available, we try to advertise it and if they are qualified, they come in, they apply for it and if, if, they, are, if they are successful, they, they come into it, provided they have the qualification. To provide oversight for the operations of the entire commission in properly carrying out its mandate and in its efficient administration of funds, there exists the Integrity Committee and the Finance Committee. This committee, through its activities, will create awareness among members of staff and among commissioners on integrity issues by um, bringing together workshops, seminars, and various forms of communication to disseminate uh, messages of integrity. So for instance, we have a popularization workshop or seminar on integrity, which we have slated for some time in September. We are also going to erect posters which have messages of integrity and our processes clearly and boldly written out in all our different offices so that when people come in, they know what to expect from us. We've also, we'll also be um, establishing an integrity box and an integrity email address which is like a contribution box or a suggestion box so where um, staff or members of the public have reports on integrity issues they want to they can deposit that in those um, integrity boxes or they can write through the integrity email address and make those complaints to the integrity committee. By law, the executive secretary and the chairman manage the commission on a day-to-day -day basis. The finance committee is created to ensure that there is prudent financial disbursement in the running of the commission. Well, we receive money from different sources and there is need to account for them in a very, very judicious manner. One, we receive government subvention. Two, we receive monies that are paid in as a result of fines or as a result of renewal of licenses. And thirdly, projects come in, finances from projects do come in. And therefore from these three sources, it is important that we know what comes in, how they are judiciously spent, and how the records are taken. And that's why we have a finance committee that is in place in a way to guide the spending of the committee guides the executive secretary, guides the chairman, 
guides the board so that there is prudent financial management in the entire institution. But what is the state of the media generally in Sierra Leone? For many analysts, the media in Sierra Leone has grown and made gigantic leaps. But from other critics, the media has not made continuity with her glorious past. We've done our best to make sure that at least there is a clear semblance of a proper journalistic practice. We are also very, very satisfied that various governments have supported the media in an attempt, I'm using the word deliberately attempt, to improve on the media. So it's here and there. We're trying our very best to make sure that we improve on it further. I think that we have come a long way from where it was many years ago. Um, the quality of journalism has improved. Um, and we have more professional people, people who have received professional training, actually practicing um, journalism now in Sierra Leone. Uh, although we still have quite a few people who are not doing it the right way, um, are not very ethical in their practices, um, whether it's because they don't quite understand what they should be doing or is they, they are doing it deliberately. I'm not quite sure what it is. We have continued to maintain a vibrant media, um, a media that has, over the years, been able to hold governments to account. So, in a way, they are responsible for um, the reasonable good health of our democracy, in a way. However, you know, um, there are still issues, um, like in most other West African countries, we still have a lot of um, rural practitioners. Um, we have practitioners who still have a lot of room for improvement. And um, the, there is the underlying media poverty. Yeah, not many people are encouraged to invest in the media. But how free is the media in Sierra Leone? The cumulative post-war record of Reporters Without Borders has given a mixed baggage of high and low moments of the Sierra Leonean press, with a rating much higher than many countries in the sub-region. It's very challenging, uh, a matter that was brought against us by uh, a human rights lawyer in the name of Pamo, lawyer Pamo Mufufana uh, about seditious libel and defamation. We were incarcerated and put behind bars for about four to five days. But at the end of the day, the matter was thrown out of court. But the recent matter, which happens to be the, with the one that has to do with the chief minister, for which, as a media practitioner, all I did was to seek clarification of an investigation that was ongoing. And I was manhandled. I was put behind bars just for seeking clarification. And as I speak, my phones are still at the CID and the matter has not been charged to court. We are now coming close to a year and the matter has not been charged to court. <laughs> it's never a smooth sailing. I've been to prison. Um, the first newspaper that I edited was the New Breed newspaper and I fell foul of the military regime at the time. I ended up at Padimba Road Prison charged with sedition and criminal libel, etc, etc. Uh, in and out of Padimba Road a couple of times. Um, eventually um, found guilty uh, but we were given the option of a fine, so we paid, paid the fine. Um, uh, gave notice of appeal, and this was in 1993. Every regime, since I started in 83, 84 under Shaki, uh, ultimately I confronted all the different regimes, and I paid the price for it. The NPLC, there was a publication, I was editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail. So there was a publication of one incident that happened in Kono. Something took place there. They killed the man. So I published that story in the Daily Mail newspaper. So the NPRC didn't like the way I published the story. 
So I was arrested. By the legal trial, he was the central information. So I was arrested and taken to Manama Road. He spent 10 days in detention. APC, uh, there was a time for election. That was 1991 or 1992. So I wrote a story that they had a secret meeting to defy the election to another time. They didn't like that idea. I published the story. APC, secret meeting. I was picked up. I was detained. They took me to court. I spent about two days at Panama Road. Eventually, the case was thrown out of court. While the corridors of power have enjoyed a certain rapprochement with the press in cocktails and subventions for the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists, on one hand, journalists with seeming dissenting voices, on the other hand, have come in for a lot of rough times. Journalists have a lot of power. Just the human rights activist, Malcolm X, who said, and I quote, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. With a media that has been historically characterized by neat political fault lines between the two dominant political parties, it begs the question when journalism is journalism and when it eventually becomes political public relations. Post-war Sierra Leone has witnessed an exponential media revolution in which the press that was traditionally state-owned and controlled with only SLBS has now become a reality in which districts, individuals and religious bodies are now owning and running media houses. 130 newspapers and magazines, 165 radio stations, 32 television stations, including satellite links direct to home DTH. While newspapers are generic in their coverage with just a handful specialized in health, commerce and education, radio has morphed into classes of being commercial, community, religious, and teaching. But the proliferation of the media in Sierra Leone has not meant its democratic distribution across the country. Western urban alone houses 94% of the print media, leaving the rest of the country with only 6%. Radio, unlike the generic nature of the print media reportage system, tends to democratize the landscape with 34% concentration in the western urban area, leaving the rest of the country to share the spoils of 66%, and is grouped along the categories of commercial, community, religious, teaching, with international relay stations of the BBC, VOA, and Radio France International being a separate group of their own. The object for which the commission is established include promoting a free and pluralistic press throughout Sierra Leone, ensuring that the media institutions achieve the highest level of efficiency in the provision of media services and protecting the interest of the public against exploitation or abuse by media institutions. The challenge is to regulate the media we are onerous, but right from inception, the Independent Media Commission, IMC, was limited in its mandate as provided by the Act and in the resources to effectively monitor and regulate the media right around the country. Some radio stations, we don't even have reporters. We employ people on a voluntary basis to report. We no incentive. Some radio stations don't even have a board. These are all the requirements that radio stations and newspapers to fulfill. But we hope that by next year, these are going to be the conditions for every newspaper and radio station to be fulfilled. Otherwise, it will be difficult for us to give a clean plate for operation. Therefore, for many, a strong and vibrant IMC was necessary and in dire need of a stronger financial muscle to regulate the media 
all over the country. Well, the most urgent thing, if you were to ask me, is to improve on the ability of newspapers and radio stations to be professional. And this in itself would suggest that over the period, the media has been starved of funding. And because it was always starved of funding, the very important component that should make good journalistic practice is always missing. People sometimes say in passing that, oh, people do not invest in the media. But of course, this in itself has a lot to do with the kind of policy framework put together by the government. If the policy framework is not conducive, then of course people will not invest in the media. But to respond to your question, yes, we need funding to make sure that uh, journalistic practice is improved upon. And we need that one very, very urgently. In June 2020, an IMC Act titled the Independent Media Commission Act 2020 was tabled by the Ministry of Information and Communication that was aimed at capacitating the institution as a safeguard for the repeal of the criminal libel law that has however attracted some reactions from the public and from journalists. They failed to consult with especially those of us who will be affected by this piece of legislation as is normally the due process. Uh, there was some kind of ulterior motive behind it. Now when you look at the content of the act itself, um, there are certain issues or clauses or provisions which I have highlighted um, and have brought to, already brought to the notice and attention of members of the public, particularly the Guild of Editors. It may interest you to know that the Guild of Editors um, Sierra Leone, which is the umbrella body for all newspaper editors, uh, was completely excluded from this particular consultation and uh, of course there was no validation process, that one uh, is not to my knowledge. Today, the nation stands at a crossroad, having won a very meaningful battle of expunging Part 5 of the 1965 Public Order Act, which criminalizes libel and has been very inimical to the operations of the media in this country. Today also we stand on the threshold of an IMC that has been greatly strengthened to effectively monitor and regulate the media in the length and breadth of Sierra Leone. The decision between the criminal libel law on one hand and a strengthened IMC with powers to enforce its mandate was a very difficult decision for journalists to make, but eventually that bridge has been thankfully crossed. Your efforts, Mr. Speaker, when you mention the names of some of our very important members. May I state, Mr. Speaker, that would be a great error on my part if I did not recognize the important talents such as Daisy Bona, the late Francis Frank Musoa, who later became the member of parliament and who was president of the Association of Journalists. Mr. Johnson. After the war, Mr. Speaker, when it became necessary for us to look at the country in a wholesome manner once more, and when President Kaba invited some of us stakeholders to a meeting, why would you should look at the regulatory component of a profession, gentlemen, before we move on to this 1965 Public Order Act? We agree with it, and then we started to put forward to the setting of the Independent Media Commission. Mr. Speaker, our thinking at the time was that the IMC would be the beginning of a regulatory authority by the journalists in this country. Now, as we all agreed at the time, that after 10 years of an IMC, we would have set in put in place motion, a motion that would make the IMC self-regulatory. I'm very excited to the extent that on the day Parliament voted to, have, to repeal it, I shed tears of joy. It had been a very long, drawn-out battle, lasting almost 50 years, 
So when it happened on that day, I was completely overwhelmed. I think it's uh, one of the brightest days in our recent history that this very obnoxious law, which basically criminalized free speech, is no longer in our statutes. I'm really very excited it is. And I feel it'll, it'll completely change the media landscape in Sierra Leone in the sense that those private sector investors who, because of the repressive nature of this law, uh, wouldn't want to invest in the media industry, would now invest in it because they don't stand the risk of being picked up and locked up simply because of the contents of a newspaper. Because under the low, old law, even you know, the printing press owner would be held liable. So would the newspaper vendor. So I believe that with that law gone, there will be more investment in the media industry now. Against the backdrop of the discussions generated by the repeal of the criminal libel law, concerns were raised as to what was there to serve as a safeguard in case of abuses of the newfound freedom on the part of journalists. While the civil libel law still exists in which aggrieved persons could seek redress in the courts, many media pundits are of the opinion that infringements concerning journalists are best handled by the commission that has the mandate to regulate the media rather than by the courts. Still in search of a safeguard, doubts started arising as to how much is the media that has the onerous responsibility in society as the watchdog in compliance with basic statutory laws in the media. If the media is looking for freedom, wants freedom, let's go back and start checking if they are in compliance with statutory laws. And so that's the basis of this particular meet the media tour that initiated this particular research right around the country. On a nationwide tour, the Independent Media Commission conducted a countrywide survey to test compliance of media houses to statutory laws. During the national tour, the IMC visited 122 media houses, which is representing 40% of the total media institutions in this country that are operated as at 2019. However, more media houses took part in the meetings held in the various locations. Well, everyone is very clumsy. Uh, your manager, I mean, cannot this one and make any financial decision. We do, the one that we call the cash. No, no, no. What is the general ledger? You're an accountant, sir. What is the general ledger? You record every financial transaction. 2019 is finishing. 2020, you make sure you keep a strict financial record. Okay? The journalism is a professional. A book. And any book. Whether it is against the new law, how you go about for that work day. That is from 1965 to now. Now that law they may not hand over journalism in this country, we give power to anybody within authority for arrest journalists as and when he wants, they will lock them up. And the key indicators the research was looking at was whether a media house had a board, whether it had a constitution or memorandum and article of association, whether it had a certificate of registration, whether the institution had a management structure, whether the institution paid salaries that are within or above the minimum wage, whether the media institution pays NASIT for its staff, whether the media institution pays payee tax, whether the media institution keeps records of withholding tax, whether the media institution has an editorial policy, a guideline, or a code. Whether the media institution has a program schedule for television and radio stations. Whether the media institution has an archive of programs or articles that are published. Whether the media institution transmits within the wattage that is apportioned to it and whether the media institution has started preparing for the migration from analog to digital broadcasting or to online publishing for newspapers. Finally, 
whether the media institution publishes or broadcasts stories and issues of national interest. The findings of this particular research are interesting as the graphs and illustrations show them. For media institutions that have a board to regulate its affairs, 63% of the media houses had a board and 37% never had a board. As to whether media institutions had a constitution, a memorandum, an article of association as established by an act of parliament, our findings were 82% had a constitution while 18% never had one. On the renewal and display of their certificate, 62% never renewed and displayed their certificates while only 38% of the media houses had renewed and displayed their certificates. For media houses who had a management structure, 65% had a management structure while 35% did not have one. On media houses that pay salaries within or above the minimum wage, 59% never paid while 40 percent paid salaries that are within or above the minimum wage. For media houses that paid NASIT for their workers, our findings give us that 66 percent of media houses do not pay NASIT for their workers, while 34 percent pay NASIT for their workers. On media houses that pay pay tax, only 30% are paying pay tax, while a whopping 70% do not pay pay tax. Of media institutions that keep record of withholding tax, only 23% of media houses in this country, while 77% do not have a record of withholding tax. For media houses that have an editorial policy, guideline, or a code, our findings gave us that 56% did not have an editorial policy, a guideline, or a code, while only 44% had an editorial policy, a guideline, or a code. For media houses that have a program schedule, this is for radio and television. We discovered that 83% had a program schedule, while 17% never had one. On whether media houses had archives of programs for broadcast media or kept account of their articles published, we discovered that only 37% of media houses have an archive for both their programs broadcast and their articles while 63% of the media do not have this form of archive. For media institutions that transmit within the prescribed wattage, our findings gave us that 67% are in breach, broadcasting sometimes above or outside the wattage prescribed for them, while only 33% of broadcast houses kept within the prescribed wattage given to them. On the level of preparedness into digital migration, it was discovered that only 18% of broadcast media is ready, while 82% is not yet ready for transfer into digital migration. On media institutions that broadcast or run stories on national issues, all media houses scored themselves a very high mark of 100% in this. In our findings, we noticed that many of the program schedules were only on paper, outdated, and were never really followed, both for radio and television. At the end of this exercise of the IMC's assessment of the media's statutory compliance, in which a vast majority of media houses were found to be non-compliant and in breach, it was agreed that these are the key challenges of the media in Sierra Leone. Management problems, sustainability, programming, 
clarity of editorial policies and problems of archiving. I honestly think that the IMC will have their job cut out for them. That is why I'm heartened by the fact that um, they have started taking preemptive steps already. I know um, the IMC has been across the country to educate journalists um, about their responsibilities um, in the post repeal era um, and the citizens generally about um, the recourse mechanisms open for them even in the absence of the criminal libel. Uh, I'm also aware that they have been doing a lot of education. So this is very good. They are situating themselves for the challenges ahead. But as ministry, we really think we have to resource them better. We have to enhance their capacity so that they are able to rise to the challenges that the post repeal era will bring. The IMC has done remarkably well up to this point. And simply because the people who have always been nominated to the, the IMC have always been journalists themselves or people who are interested in journalism, and those people who always want to see journalism prosper in this country. This is why it is doing well now. But whether they have the necessary funding to perform better than they are doing at the moment, I will say no, they don't have it. We should have a little bit more funding to make the IMC more lucrative, more effective than it is at the moment. With the criminal libel law now firmly expunged from our law books, and with a strengthened IMC, hopes are high that the media in Sierra Leone is on a very good footing. We remind media practitioners that every freedom comes with a responsibility. Let us therefore build the image of the Sierra Leone media to a very credible and reputable standard that is responsible to society and promotes the common good. Let us endeavor to promote the spirit of professionalism in the media so that the best minds could be engaged in making this profession a noble and proud one. The Independent Media Commission is here to work with and for the media of Sierra Leone in collaboration with stakeholders and the relevant authorities like the Ministry of Information and Communication, the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists and Affiliate Bodies, the Media Reform Coordinating Group, BBC Media Action, Donor Partners, the Bar Association, etc. On behalf of the Chairman and Commissioners and staff of the Independent Media Commission, we wish to thank His Excellency President Julius Madabio for believing in the media of Sierra Leone and empowering it. We thank the Parliament for passing this historic law. We thank the Minister of Information and Communication, Mohamed Rahman Suare. Profound thanks to the Sierra Leone Association of Journalists and all the gallant journalists over the years who sacrificed for press freedom in this country. Defeat Osiwa. Finally, we want to thank all media practitioners who have put their faith in this profession. The media of Sierra Leone is on a new trajectory and the hopes are high for a better Sierra Leone, land that we love our Sierra Leone.